of you heard about the guy who said, you know, some people call me self-centered, but you know, that's enough about them. <laughs> Maybe you've known somebody like that. Someone, let me take this off. <clears throat> Forgot it was on. How about that? Forgot it was on. So maybe you've known somebody like that, somebody who, who lived life like it was all about them. To be honest with you, I lived far too long in my life with that kind of an attitude. I heard a story about a guy like that, though. He arrived at the airport, and, and he needed to get his ticket at the ticket counter, and, and the line was really long. He was in a hurry, as we always are, right? And there, there he stood in line. He's a, he's a well-dressed man, and the, and the ticket agents are doing their best to serve the people in that line, but, but they weren't doing it fast enough, so finally he got so irritated that he just marched up to the front of the line, and he said, I demand you give me my ticket to get on that airplane. And the ticket agent very calmly said, Sir... As you can see, we're doing our best to serve each person. And you can see there's a long line of people ahead of you. So please, just go to the back of the line and wait your turn. And then the man became irate and got red in the face. And he said, do you know who I am? And the ticket agent, very calmly, took the microphone for the PA and said, Excuse me, attention everyone in the airport. We have a medical emergency here. There's a man at the ticket counter who doesn't remember who he is. <laughs> and if there's anyone here who can identify this man, please come forward and identify him. Thank you. And the man quietly took his place in the line. But you know, that question... That demand, do you know who I am? That's a me-centric mindset, right? It's a way of thinking and living that says, I am the center of the universe. And everything should go the way I want it to go. Everything should go the way that benefits me the most. And so there's this voice inside of us that demands, do you know who I am? I'm important. I'm special. And I shouldn't have to wait in line. Now these other lowly people, they should stand in line, but not me. <laughs> now we might not verbally say that out loud, but how often do we think that in our hearts and live that way? We might be tempted to live in a way that says, it's all about me. I am the center of the universe. And think about it for a minute. You know, for thousands of years, we earthlings enjoyed the center stage, right? Back in that day, fathers could place their arms around their children, and they could point to the sky and say, you know, the universe revolves around us. And so you see... Uh, Ptolemy's second century finding convinced us that the earth was indeed the center of the universe. And so everyone at that time believed that everything in the universe revolved around the earth. All the earth stood still, but everything else rotated and, and, and had, uh, had uh, orbits around the earth. But then in 1543, along came Nicholas... Copernicus. He had his maps, and he had his drawings, and he had his Polish accent, and he had his pestering questions. Questions like, can anyone tell me what causes the seasons to change? Or, why do some stars appear in the day and others appear at night? Or does anyone know exactly how far ships can sail before they fall off the edge of the earth? I think those are some pretty good questions, don't you? And yet he was, you know, scoffed at. People saying, who has time for such trivialities and problems? And so Copernicus persisted. He pointed the finger at the sun and he said, Behold, the center of our solar system. And guess what? People denied those facts for a half a century. 
And when the like-minded Galileo came along, guess what they did to him? Well, the throne locked him up, and the church kicked him out. Why such a reaction? Most people don't like being told that they're wrong, especially if it means a demotion. So think about it. What Copernicus did for the earth, God does for our souls. God comes to each of us who believe that we're the center of the universe, and God points to the sun, S-O-N, and he says, behold, the center of it all. Listen to what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. He, God, exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, every title given not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, Ephesians 1, 20 through 22. And similarly, when he wrote to the church at Colossae, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, and the firstborn from among the dead, so that He might come to have first place in everything. So when God looks at the center of the universe, He doesn't see you or me. And so when the heavens stagehands direct their spotlight toward the star of the show, the spotlight isn't on you, and it isn't on me. We don't have to worry about being blinded by the spotlight, right? It's not going to be on us. And so, brothers and sisters and other people of the earth, we are all lesser orbs. Yes, we're all appreciated. And yes, we're all valued. And, and yes, all of us are loved by God immensely. Praise the Lord. But no, none of us is central. Nor is any of us really essential. And so contrary to that Ptolemy within us, the world does not revolve around us. God does not exist to please me and you. Our personal comfort and our personal will is not God's priority. Sorry to break the bad news. It's not about us. It's really all about God. And so, a Copernican shift is necessary, right? It's in order. Our place is not at the center of the universe. God doesn't exist to make a big deal about us. We exist to make a big deal about God. And so it's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about God. If you're following along on your sheet, I left out a couple of, uh, a couple of those. That's, that's where the correction is. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about God. Now, for me, one of the most helpful illustrations or models of this is the moon. This is a great illustration. Think about the moon for a minute. What does the moon do? Does the moon generate any light on its own? No, obviously not. So contrary to the lyrics of the old song, the harvest moon cannot shine on, shine on, right? The moon is there to reflect the great light, right? Without the light shining on the moon, it is just a pitch black cratered rock. That's all it is. 
But when the moon plays her proper role, and when the moon is properly positioned, she can shine. How does she shine? She reflects the great light. But what an important role the moon plays as she reflects that great light. The moon becomes a source of inspiration. We all like to look at the moon at night, right? And the moon becomes the reflector of the true light on this dark earth. We too can play a role like the moon. But it requires a great shift in our thinking and in our living. And such a shift doesn't come easily. Or without some kind of stubborn resistance, right? See, most of us have been demanding our way since we came out of the womb, right? We're all kind of born with this default drive. It's set on selfishness and self-centeredness. Our default setting says it's all about me. Ask any one-year-old. It's all about me. I want to be the quarterback of the team. I want a spouse that makes me happy. I want the weather that suits me. I want the traffic that helps me. It's all about me. Self-centeredness, self-preservation, self-promotion. And it shouldn't be a surprise because that's what the world encourages us to think. We're urged to look out for number one. Guess who number one is? Depends on who's asking the question, right? We're encouraged to find your place in the sun or make a name for yourself. And we're told that living this way is what's going to make us happy. But the truth is this approach to life leads only to chaos or a dead end. What happens to a symphony orchestra? If each of the instrumentalists lives with the mindset, it's all about me. (laughs) Think about it for a minute. Picture the tubas blasting loudly and continually. Or the percussionist banging away trying to get attention. Imagine the second violinist knocking the first violinist out of the way. Or picture the trumpeter standing on the conductor's stool, tooting his own horn. In that scenario, the the sheet music is disregarded, right? The conductor is ignored, and the result is chaos. A, A virtual musical war between all the instrumentalists. There'd be no beautiful music, there'd be no harmony, and ultimately there'd be no happiness. But that's what life looks like when everyone is living with its all about me mindset. But aren't we all guilty of acting that way at times? And when we do, it's no surprise that our homes become a place of chaos. Or our businesses become stress-filled and in a dog-eat-dog kind of an atmosphere. If you think it's all about you, and I think it's all about me, we have no hope of melody, harmony. But what would happen if we all became God-centered? God-centric in our mindset. What would happen if we all took our places and we all played our parts? And what would happen if we all followed the direction of the great maestro? And we all played the music that he gave us to play. And what if we made his song our highest priority? If we made it all about him? The change would be truly revolutionary, right? I think we could call it a revival if we all became... God-centered and God-centric as a church and as a community and as a nation and as a world. It would be a huge shift. The most healthy and helpful shift imaginable because God has created us to live with a God-centered mindset. 
That's how life works best. Think about how this God-centric mindset would change our lives. Our, our relationships would be characterized by love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The two greatest commandments, right? To do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Golden rule. In our business, in our work life, we would seek to bring glory and honor to God rather than having the goals of money-making or name-making be first and foremost. And when it comes to our time or our bodies, rather than thinking, it's mine and I'll do with it as I please, we would say, it's God's. And I'll respect it as God wants me to respect it. And I'll use it as He directs me to use it. See that change? And we'll even learn to see our sufferings from a different perspective. Rather than thinking that my pain proves God's absence, we begin to think my pain expands God's purpose. So, life makes sense when we understand God. And when we accept our place in God's universe. For you see, it all really is about God. And the gifts that God gives us and the purpose behind our problems are really all for Him. And the God-centered life works. And it rescues us from the me-centered life that really doesn't work. So today's sermon is the first in a new series that I'm calling, It's All About God, Living a God-Centered Life. And I was inspired to preach this sermon after reading a book a while ago by Max Licato called, It's Not About You, Rescue from the Life We Thought Would Make Us Happy. So Max's book will be one of the resources I'll use in the series. But during this series, I want us to help us to see God and to understand God completely so that we can then reflect God clearly. God-centered understanding leads to God-centered living. If we don't rightly grasp who God is, then we can't rightly reflect who God is. And so in the first half of our series, we'll be focusing on our great God. And we'll attempt to move from that me focus to the God focus by beholding God by seeing Him clearly, by experiencing Him, trying to grasp who He is, and following the advice and the explanation that Paul gave to the church at Corinth, we'll focus on God. As Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, and we all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's the Christian Standard Bible. Here's the New Living Translation of that same verse. And so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we're changed into His glorious image. Or how about Peterson's paraphrase of the verse? Nothing between us and God, our faces shining with the brightness of His face, and so we're transfigured much like the Messiah, and our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like Him. And so when we truly behold God and grasp God, then we can be changed by God. 
couldn't we use a change? And then during the second half of the series, we'll begin focusing on reflecting a God-centered mindset in our living. And you know, I think John the baptizer is a great example of someone who had a God-centered mindset. John knew and understood the role that he had, and he was happy to play second fiddle in Jesus' orchestra, right? And so John's role as the forerunner of the Messiah meant that for a little while, he was in the spotlight. And he was getting in the place to point toward the Messiah, right? But then once the Messiah arrived on the scene, John properly pointed to him, and it was time for John to step out of the spotlight and to allow the spotlight to be on Jesus alone. And the Apostle John helps us see John the baptizer putting that very mindset into practice. In John chapter 3, when John writes, And then a dispute arose between John's disciples, John the baptizer's disciples, and a Jew about purification. And so they came to John and they told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about, Jesus, the one who is with you across the Jordan, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. You're losing the spotlight, John. You're losing your followers, John. Something needs to be done. And John, the baptizer, responded, No one can receive anything unless it's been given to him from heaven. And you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. And he who has the bride is the groom. But the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. And so this joy of mine is complete. John was the groom's friend who stood beside waiting for the groom to come, right? And this is when John says, He... Jesus must increase, and I must decrease. And so like John, our motto must be, he must increase, and I must decrease. John knew that Jesus, the Son of God, was the Son, and John was simply the moon. John was the lesser light who reflected the greater light, Jesus. It wasn't all about John. It was all about Jesus. And may God help us to learn how to make it all about God and to live a God-centered life so that when any of us declare, do you know who I am? will respond, I'm the moon. And it's my privilege to reflect the light of the Son of God. That's my job. It's not about me. It's all about Him. Amen? Amen. So join me.